there's an idea to reduce Colorado's prison population by treating some criminals like children. Did you shovel your sidewalk after the snow? Denverites are tattling on each other to the city at an astonishing rate. A next viewer wonders why the stuff that road crews put on the streets is reddish. We found the answer. School districts show us the feedback they get when they don't call a snow day. A lot of F words. And before you decide that velvet paintings are tacky, shouldn't you at least go to the museum in Denver? That's next. There's an idea to reduce Colorado's prison population by treating some adults like their children. Children who would get lighter sentences for the same crimes. I mean, what could go wrong? Here's Marshall Zellinger. The job of this legislative committee is to figure out how to reduce the prison population and decrease the number of prisoners that reoffend. One of the ideas out of this committee today would take some 18 to 25 year olds out of adult court and send them to juvenile court, possibly reducing sentences for felonies like sex assault and robbery. It wouldn't just cut the sentences in half. What it would do would be to allow someone who is up to the age of 25 to petition to be treated as a juvenile. Uh, treated as a child in our system, uh, it's certainly with much reduced accountability and much reduced punishment for those crimes. Lawmakers in the off session cannot pass laws. That has to wait until next year. But the bill that made it out of this committee will show up in some form and be introduced once the session starts in January. As of today, this idea would cost Colorado taxpayers an estimated $327 million over four years, mainly from building new bed space to house all the new young adult offenders. It's costly monetarily, of course, to taxpayers, to the state. Um, it's also costly as far as our communities are concerned. Um, if we are not helping individuals be able to rehabilitate, go back into their communities, it is costing more victims. It can be costing, um, you know, more to our society. It's been pointed out to me this is the first step of the process. The Republicans on this committee were against this proposal. And in my history at the Capitol, Kyle, when you have that number of uh, dollar amount, $327 million, it's yeah. usually dead on arrival. Yeah. So it, wait a second. We're going to have fewer people in prison and it's going to cost us more money? I think the argument is up front. Yeah. You have to pay to house these people, but mm -hmm. long term, they won't be back in prison. Thus, you'll save money long -term. on the back end. Okay. All right. All right. Well, then you make the argument. See how it goes. All right. Thank you, Marshall. When you hit delete on an email, you're cleaning up your inbox. When a state employee hits delete on an email, that could prevent all of us from seeing what is a public record. The difference highlights a gap identified by the Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition, which says that our state lags behind technology. We are concerned and have been concerned for quite a while that um, technology is, is overtaking the open records laws in Colorado in, in regard to the retention of electronic messages like emails and text messages, things like that. State law requires government agencies to have a policy. Though they're allowed to make their policy, we don't need no stinking policy. So we requested the email retention policy from 21 state departments and offices. So far, we've heard back from 15. Six of them have 30-day retention policies, unless employees mark those emails, do not delete. The governor's office, lieutenant governor's office, and Department of Corrections work that way. The state health department and Department of Healthcare policy keep emails for three months. Five departments have no policy at all, including CDOT, and the IT department. Come on, IT. Just just wild westing it out here, deleting any public record you want whenever you want. We need to have a discussion about what's what's a better way to do it, perhaps that provides um, uh, more consistency with how records are kept and, the, and and making them more available to people when they make when they're interested in making public records requests. And hey, credit where credit is due to other journalists in town. The Denver Post brought this to light by reporting that the Department of Regulatory Agencies is getting ready to delete hundreds of its emails. The department wouldn't talk to us about that. We're still waiting on their policy as well. Hopefully it has not been deleted. If you needed to warm up today, you could have just huddled around the social media accounts of Jeffco and Boulder Valley Schools. Those two refused to call a snow day, and they got burned for it all day long. This is on the Internet, so of course, people are being heinous. Steve Steger peers into the cesspool, and he looks back at the snow day rage before social media. 
this has been a tough couple of days, I will say. With snowstorms come decisions. We care deeply about the students and the staff. Tough decisions. Today, Boulder Valley schools opted to buck the trend of other districts in the metro area, delaying school instead of canceling it. Randy Barber and his team had to communicate that message. And they had to read the feedback, too. I hope that you slip and die so that you feel at least a little bit of remorse. Snow day, nah, I'd rather have some injuries and a two-hour delay. The responses are almost as brutal as the roads can be during a snowstorm. A lot of, a lot of F words. I'll go ahead and say it, you know, F you, BBSD. There are ways to express your displeasure, but it doesn't have to be... Uh, with expletives. Ginger Ramsey has been the principal at Broomfield High School for 20 years. They were convinced we were going to have a snow day today. And when that didn't happen, that's when everyone got grumpy. She remembers the good old days before social media, when the only griping you heard was on the rare occasion school was canceled. Some disgruntled parents, uh, but truly the disgruntlement came from my athletes and my activity students because when school is closed, you can't do practices or theater rehearsals or anything like that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of clown emojis. Barbara says while the comments hurt, he's hopeful there's a teachable moment in this. And we talk a lot in our schools about, you know, digital citizenship and the way that you should use media, but also, you know, uh, what, that, what, what your responsibility is in those environments. For next, I'm Steve Steger. Denver got colder than those mean tweets sent to school districts, a record low of three degrees this morning. Iced out the old record of seven degrees from 1991. What's really cold, though, is the way that neighbors in Denver are narking on each other for unshoveled sidewalks. Last year, Denver 311 took 1,961 calls for sidewalk snow removal. So far this year, 4,942 that's real cold. More than 1,100 of those calls were from March's bomb cyclone. What's also bomb is just shoveling out your neighbors if you're able, instead of informing on them to the government. Yes, absolutely. Help a neighbor out. Beautiful views across downtown Denver and beyond. This is a top lookout mountain. Looks beautiful, covered in white. As we head toward this evening, our storm system has moved out. The clear skies have moved in, and that means once again another cold one. My forecast low of 3 degrees, and that could once again smash the current record that is 10 last set back in 1991. Looks like overnight lows bottoming out sub-zero in Greeley, Lyman, and then up through the high country. Across the far eastern plains, we do have a winter wind chill advisories where the wind chill could easily go uh, as low as 15 below. Tomorrow the sunshine is out. Temperatures slightly warmer. How about the mid 40s? Keep in mind we should be at 60 degrees. 50s in Lamar and Springfield with 30s and 40s mainly up in the mountains. So what about the trick-or-treating forecast? It should be dry. However, you will have to watch out for those snowy sidewalks. But chilly temperatures too. Right about 6 o'clock, upper 30s by the time they're winding things down in the upper 20s. Our storm system moves out, impacting parts of the eastern side of the country. High pressure is around, but another storm system waiting in the wings. That one will bring us a cooler day on Friday. Friday at 33, but we bounce back for the weekend in the 40s and 50s. Our next question comes from a husband and wife who watch next, and we're watching the roads during this morning's commute. Shannon and Ty wondered about the de-icing mixture on the streets and why it's that reddish color. Denver Public Works uses Ice Slicer. It's a natural mineral salt product that's mined in southern Utah. It comes from a halite deposit. It's made up of a number of minerals and complex chlorides. The color comes from the minerals. Ice Slicer says it's so natural it's organic probably wouldn't want to put it on your popcorn. But Denver Public Works says the red color has a side benefit. It helps the plow drivers easily tell which roads have already been treated. The attempts to recall Democratic Governor Jared Polis did little except provide months of comedic bumbling. And the latest has to do with those Polis pennies. We told you how the Resist Polis PAC thought that they could get around campaign finance laws by taking in $20 donations and giving back Polis pennies in return. This is where the narrator says they could not get around campaign finance laws. The PAC has now been hit with a fine for its penny refunds. It will cost them $2,300, 230,000 pennies. Next, we'll meet an art collector with a soft spot for velvet. I've seen serious paintings done on velvet, and I've seen the most tacky artwork ever. He's turning it into Denver's newest art museum. 
and students learning about science in the most perfect way possible for Halloween week. I feel like I'm a doctor about to do some surgery. Is that what I think it is? We'll find out next. Coors is moving its headquarters out of Colorado after 146 years here. And that impacts 300 of our neighbors' jobs. People who told our Katie Eastman they will still always associate that beer with our state. This iconic brewery in Golden comes to mind when we talk about Coors, but it's the people in this building in downtown Denver who will take the blow of the beer giant moving homes. For now, 1801 California is where Molson Coors is headquartered, but they're moving to Chicago because the company says they need to consolidate. Many of the 300 people who work here will be offered to move with the company. No, economic developers never like to lose, um, but certainly uh, we can only do so much to influence companies to either come here or to continue to invest here. The VP of the Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation wishes Coors would stay, but he won't say he's upset or disappointed. Sam Bailey even plans to keep all this memorabilia above the coffee nook. They're still a major employer in Colorado. <laughs> Good question. Though. The company said they will lay off four to five hundred people across the board. Some of them could be in Denver and Golden. They don't plan to lay off any of the hourly brewery workers. You can take the company out of Colorado, but you cannot change its story of where it came from. Molson Coors boosted Bailey's faith by also announcing they will invest several hundred million in Golden's brewery, where they still employ around 2,000 people. For next, I'm Katie Eastman. All right, so with Coors gone, who do you think becomes the largest brewery headquartered in Colorado? You, you just shout, shout the guess at the TV. I, I can hear it. It works like that. Some of you got it. Brewers Association of Boulder says New Belgium is now Colorado's largest brewery headquartered here. Viewers question about uh, why part of downtown Denver streets are set diagonal. Denver Public Works Western History Department told us that a congressional grant set the boundaries in a northeast direction in 1864. Few of you wrote in to say that that was because the streets were parallel to the Platte River. That is also correct. The library confirmed that an earlier settler, settler in Denver laid out streets parallel to the river. It was pretty common practice at the time. According to historians, Golden was laid out parallel to Clear Creek as well. Now, a few of you also thought that the later east-west, the direct cardinal orientation was to help with snow melt, like the way that the sun comes up. The library's historian couldn't find anything on that and kind of doubted that, thinking that if that was the case, then the roads would have been laid out to catch the sun, but then melt into the creek. All right, if you have a weak stomach, this, this is the warning right here. Our next story involves both eyeballs and brains. And you're going to see just a little bit of them. It is Halloween week after all. But this isn't about zombies. This is about a program at a local library that encourages kids to love science. Here's what our Ann Herps witnessed this week. Are you returning it? Yes. Great. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you very great. much. Libraries are where minds are exposed to new places. I found it. Eye-opening ideas, too. We're talking eyeballs here. And at anything here on Street Library. All right. Eyes are opened. But you're going to cut around the cornea. In a very literal way. Eyes, my favorite dissection. Know why? Andrea Hildebrandt isn't a mad scientist. No, I've got one of those disorders. I've got a lazy eye. She's mad for science and runs science on demand. I'm a former science teacher and, uh, you know, it's just fascinating to, to learn about science. And sometimes in a little more informal setting <laughs> uh, can really pique a, a kid's interest. The lens, again, when it is alive, is clear. Anything invited Andrea and her cow eyeballs here. <laughs> just in time for Halloween. There's parts of it that can be kind of like thick, like a jelly. Perfect timing for kids' minds to run wild. I feel like I'm a doctor about to do some surgery on an eye. I think I can pull this out. The brain is waking up. So I'm gonna cut it in half so we can look inside. Sheep brains turn a learning experience for some. That looks like chicken meat. Into a horror film for others. Somebody said it looked like chicken. I'm not having chicken for dinner. 
This library and Andrea gets to them while they're young. There is no better like tactile experience than actually like you know, holding an actual eyeball to actually really make you appreciate your own body. They know kids learn in all sorts of ways. And see how it has a weird growth on it? And sometimes books just don't cut it. Oh, nice iris. For next, this is Ann Herbst. So all those eyeballs and brains, they tell us, are byproducts from the meat processing industry. Use every last bit, I suppose. We have a tribute to the art of velvet next. Phil Castillo writes in on Facebook tonight, please bring back the cool suits. It's half the reason I watch. Phil, black velvet is more than cool. It's art. Just ask the guy who's opening up the Denver Museum of the Velvet Arts. I've seen serious paintings done on velvet, and I've seen the most tacky artwork ever. My name is Scott Dammit, and I am a velvet art collector. Finally, I've been given the chance to display my private collection of velvet paintings that I've collected over the last 20 some years. The Denver Museum of the Velvet Arts was just my private collection of six or seven pieces to begin with, and then it just grew and grew, and now we're up to roughly 100 pieces. The first piece I ever actually acquired is this one here, and I bought it in 1995 in Boulder, Colorado. I love finding one that I've never seen before. I love seeing something that just absolutely is out of the ordinary. I have a couple amazing unicorn velvet paintings. My favorite piece is actually in our tiki bar. It's gigantic, it's tropical, and it's on orange velvet. But yeah, sometimes you will just walk into a place and you'll see a clown and it just, you kind of wonder why some of these were painted, but someone loved them, someone had them in their house, and now they're in our collection. They could paint something on this, something, something tasteful, something small. The museum opens Friday night at 6 o'clock at the Waiting Room Gallery on Larimer. Larimer. It'll be there at least through the end of the year. Tonight we have wonderful news for a historic home that we showed you on next. It was the house that belonged to Colorado's first black female doctor. And it's getting a share of a $2 million preservation grant. Dr. Justina Ford earned her license, but she was denied membership to the Colorado Medical Society. It meant that she couldn't work in hospitals, so she treated patients out of her home at California and 31st. That home is one of 13 grant-winning sites, only one in Colorado. You always receive the last word with your feedback. Next. We finish with your feedback, and Jonathan Wolfer writes in tonight to thank us for amplifying how inappropriate social media responses were to today's school decisions about snow days. I get that some people might say ignore them, but I think that you should see what Colorado school leaders actually have to deal with on a day like this. Ethan says, Kyle, coming from a 16-year-old, why are you such a relatable person? Probably because I'm so immature, Ethan. <laughs>